because, uh, you know, LinkedIn is, is a professional networking. So uh, my boss did it on Twitter. So oh, that is bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally different. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So we are being live stream. Um, and that is loading up. All right. Great. Okay, so let's kick this baby off. So welcome everybody to another uh, safety view. We've got an amazing show lined up for everybody. This is a place where we have safe, organic conversations. Everybody has, we encourage a dis to disagree as long as it's done in a respectful manner um, to one another. And people may have different views. So keep the conversation going in a respectful manner and let's level it up. So we're really thinking about about professional discussions and um, arguments here. So I'm gonna hand it right over to you, Gary, to take it away. Thank you, Tamara. Well, welcome everybody, whether it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Well, today uh, I have the real pleasure of introducing a person who really need, needs no introduction, Karsten Bush. karsten has been on, on us with before, so welcome, Karsten. And the book we're going to talk about uh, one of many books, but we'll talk about is most recent, is the one you see in my background. The First Rule of Safety Culture, a counter C-word manifesto. So why don't we also get right into it? Carson, what is the first rule of safety culture? Thanks, Gary, for the nice introduction. And thanks for having me again. And well, letting me talk about my, uh, my little hobby, which is uh, safety in many of its forms. And um, well, <clears throat> the, the title of the book is, of course, uh, inspired by uh, the movie Fight Club, where there is a first rule of Fight Club, which is you do not talk about Fight Club. And I would like... Uh, to suggest the exact same thing uh, if you want to work uh, on safety culture uh, please do it but don't speak about it or at least as little as possible yeah so so that's your second rule of culture right you do not talk about safety culture right? you definitely oh, can you just, don't can you just give a brief minute why i understand when you and i were chatting you weren't planning to write this book were you uh well I, I was planning to write a book about culture sometime in the future. I, I really was. And in, in my first book, uh, Safety Mid 101, there's a little chapter on culture. And I suggested there probably will be a longer chapter in some future edition. But last summer, I, I was actually writing another book, a Dutch book on uh, risk. And at some point, I got so fed up uh, with a lot of uh, talk about safety culture on, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, mostly, uh, that I uh, just had to write a book. Uh, pure frustration. I, I was so frustrated. I thought, now I have to get this uh, culture book or this anti-culture book out of my system. And I sat down and I had five years of material uh, lying around. And I think I wrote it in uh, six weeks or something. Cool, All right. Okay. Well, when you wrote the book, who did you have in mind as the reader? Well, for, first of all, uh, my, uh, my many peers, uh, other uh, safety professionals, practitioners. Um, and uh, well, of course, uh, all the people peddling uh, safety culture programs and so on, uh, because it's it's uh, very much uh, a critique towards what they are doing. And, and often, let, let's don't misunderstand me. I think many of these people are actually doing it uh, with uh, with honest and uh, good intentions, but that doesn't make it useful per se. All right. Okay. So let's dive right into the book itself. It's a really easy book to read. And uh, I, I found when I read it, I do get emotionally tied with you. I can see you kind of like venting a bit there and criticizing in a good way. So I think it's a fun read. Well, the book is divided into um, six parts. In part one, the overture, you set a scene with some history on safety culture. And for many of us, the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear 
plant accident was the triggering event for another explosion. Because what it did is put a vast amount of attention and literature on safety culture. Can you further expand on that? Uh, yes, I, I can, of course, a bit. Um, and, and please stop me if this is going to be a boring uh, history lesson. We'll try to avoid it. But uh, there has really been uh, some writing and, and discussion of uh, culture in relation to safety and risk uh, before uh, 86. Um, and, and that goes back uh, almost to the start of safety, because in, in the 1920s, mid 20s, uh, there, there is this uh, chap, uh, Louis de Blois. Uh, he was a VP of safety, the first VP of safety of uh, DuPont. And then he wrote a really nice book on safety organization. And there he suggests something uh, uh, he called safety atmosphere. If you read what he, what he talks about, that's what we call culture today. Something in the air that affects people and, and well, helps them to, to work safely and so on. And also in the 70s uh, you, and 80s, you find uh, Barry Turner talks about culture. Uh, you have uh, Douglas, uh, Mary Douglas who talks uh, very extensively about culture and risk. But then 86, uh, Chernobyl happens and, and the report uh, mentions safety culture quite a lot. And, and somehow uh, it caught on that time. It didn't uh, catch on earlier, really. There weren't a lot of people uh, discussing uh, uh, culture or atmosphere uh, be before 86. But uh, after 86, uh, people started uh, uh, repeating uh, the, the, the terms, the, the, the phrase. And I guess that's uh, because uh, by that time, uh, organizational culture had become a thing within management literature. Tom Peters, for example, with his uh, uh, excellence book, uh, talks a lot about culture. Cotter does it. Uh, you had uh, Deal and Kennedy, who did a, a quite famous book on, uh, on uh, culture, where they come with this uh, definition of a culture is how we do things around here. So I, I think at that point in time, uh, the world was just ripe to embrace uh, the concept. And it's, it's such a nice concept in several ways. Uh, good and bad and well it it continued and it continues still it's uh, you could say it was a fad or a fashion but it's i think it's now common practice yeah so after that part one introduction then you start kind of getting into it in the book so in part two you introduce an interesting term cultural babble what is the issue here and what message are you trying to convey to readers? Yeah, I, I, as I told you, and as I haven't uh, mentioned in the book, but perhaps I, I should, uh, the, the term culture babble, it was inspired by a Alan Parsons project, a song called uh, Psycho Babble. And, and the meaning or the message in, in that song is there's such a lot of uh, uh, psychological uh, literature around uh, that doesn't really add a lot of value, but is very popular and gets uh, repeated. And I thought that's the exact same thing that I see uh, in relation to culture. People are repeating the term and using the term and using the term uh, also, I would say inappropriately that they use the term uh, more as a blanket to cover up, uh, not, not intentionally per se, but to cover up other stuff that they really want uh, to talk about. Let me just give an example. And this, this was one of the triggers of the book. Um, I saw a message on LinkedIn, which was posted by the Dutch uh, Railway uh, Inspectorate, I think. Um, about uh, safety. We need to work on safety culture on the railways because uh, people don't report enough and we want to learn about accidents. So we need to build safety culture or improve safety culture. And I thought, no, you don't. What, what you really are talking about is uh, people don't report enough and we, they don't learn enough from events. Don't call it culture because it, it only messes things up people don't know what it is, uh, what you're talking about. But if you talk about what your real problem is, 
uh, then you will uh, probably uh, get much greater effect. But it doesn't sound as fancy, of course. So that, that's what I labeled culture babble. People are using the term just yeah, to, to sound fancy or whatever. Tamara, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to just kind of push because what you're saying right now is so important. And, I, and I've seen it also in action. So um, that is a mislabeling going on. But can you push a little bit further about what actually is going on that the professional, because it is a concern if some if people are not reporting, but there is more going on there. So maybe if you could dive into that, what the more is. Sorry, I, I, I don't quite, I, I don't entirely uh, uh, understand the question. You, you, you mean if people don't report, what, what, what's the problem with that? Uh, well, the, what, what, one of the issues is, of course, uh, that uh, bad the, news. Not got... what's the problem with that, but what is actually, it's not about the safety culture, right? Yeah. It's, there's another, there are other elements going on there that need to be unearthed? Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, people should be specific if you want improvements. If, if you want improvement, let's take a silly example. Say I, uh, I feel a bit uh, sick and I go to the doctor and the doctor says, you should live more healthy. Uh, thank you very much, but... I would like to know what's the problem with me now and what can I do? Uh, okay, living healthy in general is probably a good, uh, good, good advice, but it isn't very helpful. I, I want something uh, concrete. And yeah, uh, it's, it's the same with, with safety culture and uh, that, that, you, <clears throat> yeah, that, that you have an issue with learning, for example, and that you say, well, we need to improve our safety culture. Yeah, okay, but culture can be so much yeah. yeah yeah i think you put you have a good example when james reason introduced the idea of there's a reporting culture there's information culture and there's a culture culture sort of stuff here and i think that caused you to go like well why do we always have to add the word culture to the end of everything yeah why don't we kind of get more into it and yeah, I, and I, I really like uh, like Reason's uh, work on this uh, for in, in his famous uh, 97 uh, book uh, about management of organizational uh, accident or risk. Um, <clears throat> I think it's it's it, it was in a way groundbreaking what he did and, and then suggesting uh, five different aspects to safety culture. Um, and it's useful to think about it, but by, by labeling them culture, he also misses a lot, I think, because it, it, it only confuses more. Okay, no, we, we have safety culture, and safety culture is made up of reporting and learning and, and, and the other three, just and yeah, I, I informed, flexible, that's the five. It, it just confuses thing more, and, and there's more aspects than just these five uh, to, uh, to to culture or the safety aspects of culture. Because you could also say uh, there is a there is a trade off culture because safety is a lot about uh, making trade offs between production and other th uh, things, and then not in least uh, safety, of course. Yeah. So Vincent had a question, Vincent. <clears throat> You're muted. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Carson, I, I like very much what you're, what you're saying. Um, what I'm looking at here, and I wrote down some notes for myself, uh, I'm viewing the word culture similar to what the word team meant in Japanese. Uh, instead of think, people calling groups committees, everybody became a team. And frankly, team was not what the Japanese really meant. So basically, I see it in terms of the definition of the word culture. Okay, that is not clear to many people. For example, I see, um, if I look back many years, okay, uh, safety was the job of the sp safety specialist. That was the whole culture. The safety specialist, that was their job. 
nobody else had to worry about safety, that person would handle it. You look at the other end and I'm looking at, I am my brother's keeper. I'm concerned about the safety of my coworker and myself. That is a different culture. So I think if we begin with the word, what in the world is the definition of culture and are the two extremes that I just identify in that line? I, I'm really glad you uh, bring this in at this point, uh, Vince. Thanks a lot. Uh, be, because when uh, Tamara asked about what's the problem uh, about uh, calling something culture, uh, that there's actually uh, the, the definition thing. Because we all speak about culture all the time. We also speak about safety all the time. And we just assume that the counterpart uh, knows what we are talking about and that they have the same definition that we have. Uh, and that's probably not the case. And, and perhaps we're, we're talking about uh, entirely different uh, kinds of safety uh, and probably we are putting different things into, uh, into uh, culture too. I saw he disappeared just from, from the chat uh, that I can see here, but uh, there was somebody uh, who uh, asked about uh, behavior and uh, culture. And there are a lot of people uh, who believe that uh, behavior and uh, culture are basically the same thing. They are related, but they're definitely not the same thing. Okay. Can we, can we just hold all the questions right now? Because there's a lot of stuff in the book that we want to cover. And perhaps as we go through some of this stuff here, it's a good possibility that you may have your question answered. So let me do that first to set the stage and then perhaps you can answer some, ask some questions after that. It's not really a question, uh, Gary. Okay, um, go ahead then. I want to amplify uh, perhaps a, a something that Karsten is getting at here. Um, it came to me that the use of the word culture when we use it, where it's really just a broad term uh, when we don't understand the human elements in a situation. That, that's really essentially what it means. We don't really understand why this happens, so we're going to put it under the culture banner here. Uh, because then everybody has a sense of understanding it. I mean, there is a gut understanding about what culture means. It, it means that there's all of these forces, all of these demands, all of these expectations from peers and bosses that are constantly uh, impinging on us and directing the way that we behave. Uh, and we just, it's, it's just a very difficult topic, but I do think when we use the word culture, we all go, yeah, yeah, it's in that arena. What do you think yeah. about that, um, Carson? I think that's uh, the. I just I had to write it down that uh, weren't your words. I'm paraphrasing here, but the culture is an admission of we don't really know, but there is something. That's that's quite <laughs> quite a nice definition, and I think that that goes back to the origin of of the term culture uh, too, in in the anthropological uh, sense, because uh, that that's where culture in the meaning of something uh, happening between people. Uh, comes from from anthropology not from engineering or management or, or whatever but uh, people who went out uh, watched some tribe of a group of people and then saw that there were some regularities between these people uh, in how they behaved how they communicated with each other perhaps how they dressed their the rituals they performed and and they saw well there's something governing their behavior uh, which we can't see, but it's there. And well, let's call it culture. And, and that, that, that external, internal force between the people uh, in that group, uh, well, that, that's culture. And, and as you say, uh, Rosa, it's, it's something that we don't quite understand, but we know there's something and it's made up of beliefs. It's made up of uh, rules, written or not. It's made up of social conventions, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, right. Well, there seems to be two contrasting views of culture. One is what we call the mechanistic engineering perspective, where we create a clear 
predictable future state. We design a linear blueprint and then we build it. The other view is ecological and treats culture as something that emerges and evolves towards an uncertain future. Can you shed some more light, Karsten, on the differences? Yeah, I, I tend to say uh, the, the first one that you described as the engineering approach to culture, I would say uh, it tries to use culture as a tool. You have a group of people and you want this group of people uh, to do something uh, your way, uh, like behaving safely, uh, doing the work safe and, and all that. Uh, so you devise some kind of a scheme and... Uh, which sounds more negative than I mean, <laughs> but uh, you, you devise something and then you try to implement it and, and yeah, you call that a safety culture. And then uh, on the other hand, uh, which is more the, the anthropological uh, view of safety, you have people who use uh, uh, culture not as a tool, but as a lens to look at, uh, at a group and then uh, try to understand what is going on uh, in, in that group. Um, and, and then use perhaps the results of that explanation to uh, suggest the improvements <clears throat> if, uh, if necessary. Or, well, sometimes you're just satisfied of having uh, analyzed and well uh, found an explanation for what I see. <clears throat> so that, I think that's the, the basic difference between the, the two. Uh, there's the one, the, the first one, which is uh, the, the one that's uh, very much liked by, by management and consultants and, and also many practitioners uh, see uh, safety culture as uh, one of several tools in, in the safety toolbox trying to improve safety. Uh, and, and then there's the, the, the second one that, uh, well, an accident has happened and then we don't use a culture as a cause per se, but uh, we, we use culture as a way of trying to understand what happened and why it happened. And, and Diane Vaughan's uh, work on, on the Challenger uh, uh, incident is, I think, uh, one of the greatest examples of, of the second uh, way uh, she really immersed herself into an organization, studied uh, NASA and, and their uh, environment uh, for seven years or something, and then wrote, uh, well, what is it, 450 pages, uh, where she really uh, well explains what she observes, what went on in, in the years up to uh, the incident and also after, uh, and then explains it uh, from, from the cultural uh, perspective of uh, well did, did, this is how they did work and this is why why they did it yeah. I like how you mentioned in the book how that second approach um, is guided by complexity science principles okay. can you mention a couple of those principles that um, we, we should know about um, in, in, in my book, uh, I suggest some principles uh, to, to look at uh, culture, and, and one of them is about uh, complexity. Uh, let me just start by, by the, with, with the first ones. Uh, I think you, when you are thinking about culture, you should at least keep three things in mind. The first is culture is not a thing. As we discussed uh, um, Culture is what you observe, uh, what, what you can't observe, but what you uh, suggest is there uh, when you observe a group of people interacting. You see these people, they behave in a certain way, they talk in certain ways, they dress in certain ways, and so on. And you suggest, well, there, there are some cultural influence. But you can't see culture in itself. You can't touch it. It, it isn't a thing. It's a construct we use to explain something. So that's the first. Culture is a construct. It's not an object, which makes it, for example, very hard to count culture or measure culture or whatever you want. Uh, the second thing is uh, culture is about a group of people. It's not an individual thing. I don't have a culture. 
uh, I, I'm a culture person, of course, but I, I don't have a culture uh, myself. But, but uh, there, if you watch my family interacting, you could suggest maybe there is a family culture here. If you go to, to my workplace, you will see some interaction there and then you can infer, well, there's something in, in the group culture, the sub uh, subculture of my organization where I work and so on. But the culture is always about a group of people. It's not an individual thing and therefore it's different from behavior. That's one of the reasons why it's different from behavior. And then the third thing, uh, since it's a group of about a group uh, thing, culture is a group thing, uh, a group of people is a complex system. Uh, so culture is something that emerges from a complex system. And then I've tried to specify that a bit, uh, uh, complex system, uh, wh whatever comes out of it, it's not per se dependent on the parts, but mostly on the interactions, uh, uh, the cause-effect relationships are not uh, necessarily linear, there, there will be linear effects, but also non-linear and surprising effects. Uh, and and several so we, we talk about the emergence then i, I can't remember did you uh, mention emergent in in the second view of a culture yeah yeah emergence yeah. and i do like your other principle you mentioned that culture is neutral it is what it is <clears throat> it, it, it is what it is it, it is the result of your system and and it's functional in its own way and and perhaps we don't like it <laughs> We, we may uh, think, well, this, this culture, uh, what, what we see in that group, it's, it's not what we would like to have, but it has brought the group to where they are. So it has been functional for them, at least for a while. And, and perhaps it's turned sour on the ways and become uh, dysfunctional for certain uh, uh, functions. But yeah. it, it, it is what it is. Yeah, and I, I do like your summary in the book where you say that improving the culture of an organization then means not addressing individual behavior, but the underlying system issues that create behavior. Yes, um, and, and you can certainly try to work on it by addressing individual behavior, but um, it will be very tedious and long-winded and probably not successful. Um, if you uh, look at uh, systems, systems are made up of at least three things. Parts, like people in a group. Then there's interaction between the parts, which are very essential. And uh, then this group, uh, the, the system, these parts, uh, that they have a common uh, goal. And if you want to uh, affect the system uh, very effectively, you either change the goal or you address the interactions. Working on individual parts uh, often is not very successful. Uh, it, but some parts, let's just uh, acknowledge that, some parts of the system are probably more effectful than others. Like when you change out a CEO, it may have a greater effect uh, than when you change out uh, the safety uh, officer in an organization. Right. <clears throat> I've just been monitoring the chat panel and there's quite a few questions. I think in parts three and four in your book, Carson, you really address quite a few of these things because you talked about harmful safety myths that we must aware of. And I think that brings back to your first book about safety myths. Can you just mention a few of them that you want to point out as things that we got to be very cautious of? <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, I think the first one I mentioned already uh, that uh, uh, culture uh, being measured and culture is measurable. Uh, culture is not measurable as such, because we don't know what culture is. Culture is just uh, something we made up in our minds uh, to explain something we observe. And then we uh, connect uh, certain things with uh, this uh, construct we have made, culture. Uh, 
like uh, James Reason did, uh, he, he talks about uh, reporting and he talks about learning and he talks about flexibility and uh, some, uh, some other uh, stuff. And, and then you could, of course, try uh, to measure some of these uh, things we connect to uh, culture. So you could, for example, look into uh, the number of reports in an organization and track that from one year to the next and then have an opinion whether things improved or not. And then you could say, well, that part of uh, safety culture uh, improved. Um, but you're only uh, measuring it. What, what you measure when you do a culture assessment is not culture as such. It's a number of things that you associate with culture and that perhaps don't give the, the whole picture, most likely not. And um, perhaps you're even measuring stuff that doesn't say very much about culture at all. So that, that's one of, one of the things. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm mostly against them trying to measure culture, I would say. Uh, that's not to say that you can't use these measurements for something good. So if you do a safety culture assessment, for example, I think you could use the results uh, as very usefully uh, to discuss with people and internally in the organization. Well, this is a measurement we did. Uh, what do we think about this? Is this how we like ourselves? Is there something we could approve? Uh, but then don't use the assessment, the measurement as an answer, but use it as a start of a discussion. I, I think that's, that's the only useful way of using uh, uh, assessments or culture measurements. Yeah. <clears throat> so what so is, other, oh, go ahead, sorry, carry on. No, uh, okay. please. Well, please. Yeah, I'm just watching the time. We're at the bottom of an hour, and there's a couple more pieces I think I want to cover. So if we've got time in the end, we can come back and just let you know that um, in the book, Carson covers a lot more myths if you want to get into it. So um, be sure to read that. But in parts four and five, you delve deeper into the dark side of culture, where you talked about before various safety culture as a tool offerings management can buy from consultants to tackle an immensely complex issue. What are you seeing that really makes you cringe? Well, the, the thing that makes me cringe the most, and then the, really that makes me furious and fuming inside is when people are trying to certify uh, safety culture. And, and it's happening, uh, especially in the Netherlands, uh, where... Uh, they took a, a transformed a form of the Hearts and Minds tool that, that Shell had based on the safety culture letter by Patrick Hudson and, uh, and so on. And, and they uh, turned it into a certification scheme, uh, which then uh, is used as a tool to um, award uh, jobs for contractors. And then... The, the thinking is, in a naive way, probably a good, uh, that, that you think, well, um, a company that has, uh, is on a certain level on this culture ladder uh, probably has a uh, good uh, safety and will probably deal with safety very well. So let's require a certain level and then they can get a job. Uh, the problem is, and this is uh, called uh, uh, Goodhart's uh, law, if a measure is getting more important than uh, what it tries to measure, uh, then it loses all its value. So when uh, a level on this ladder, on, on this safety uh, step uh, steps, uh, gets uh, more important than, than safety, the, the level is important because Otherwise, you don't get jobs, so you lose uh, a lot of money or you can't make money at all. Uh, people will do anything to, to get a position on, the, on that ladder that is required. And, and there are much easier ways of getting through a certification scheme than a working hard on safety. 
So uh, that really uh, uh, makes me uh, fume uh, because uh, it was a good idea because I think this, uh, this uh, safety ladder idea, it, it is a useful way again to discuss uh, internally uh, what, what do we think about uh, how we are doing on safety, but then twists it into something uh, totally different and, and I think uh, the, this, the value for safety is gone. Yeah. And, and it, it gives an illusion of control uh, to, to managers and, and uh, all the uh, procurement people because, well, we, we have someone, uh, we have a firm here who's on uh, level four of this ladder, so they're really good. It's four out of five. Wow. Uh, and, and then, yeah, M maybe they just got through the audit and yeah, don't do safety at all, yeah. right. so right. to speak. You, you have a really good section talking about culture by algorithm, because I think you and I had this chat about we're seeing a lot more commercial products coming on board saying, if you do this, you can reduce uncertainty. And here's a tool that somehow strips away complexity and makes it really simple for you. Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's it's basically in, in all its forms, and I in in the book I mostly discuss it is uh, just culture algorithm, which is uh, quite uh, successful in in at least commercial ways. Um, it it really uh, oversimplifies uh, the the whole matter, and and I also think it starts uh, basically at the wrong end because it it starts by assuming uh, that people did something wrong, instead of uh, assuming that uh, uh, well uh, innocent until proven otherwise. But it, it, this is the, the the other way around. This is uh, your. Uh, we assume that you did something wrong uh, on, until uh, we can prove that you didn't, which, which is a, a bit weird. But it, it mostly it oversimplifies uh, the matter in a couple of yes, no questions, um, which don't do justice uh, to the complexity that people are dealing with and, and the various uh, um, uh, trade-offs they have to make in, in, their, in their work. And, and that's, I, I understand why these tools are uh, successful. And I understand that I provide a sense of uh, a process and then system to management who has to, to deal with a, with a pretty tricky uh, question because, okay, people make uh, mistakes and make errors uh, that happens uh, and we need to allow this. But uh, on the other hand, uh, well, uh, yeah, something really bad happened and, and the easy way out is uh, punishing somebody uh, often. That's just how it is. Uh, so uh, is there some help to, to get uh, this uh, done in, in uh, well, <laughs> a proper uh, way and, and these, these algorithms uh, offer a way out and, and I, I don't know perhaps they're better than nothing I'm not I'm sure just gonna I, jump. I, I don't think uh, sorry Atomar, I just finished my sentence I, I don't think uh, there's been any real uh, research into this whether they're better or worse uh, I, I think they're mostly very strong opinions and until now, I'm in the. Um, I don't think it's a good idea, Camp. Sorry, I'm just going to. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in here because Fred does have a question for you. So, Fred, I've asked you to unmute. If you could ask Carson. Yeah, it seems that, that um, addressing. Uh, oh, Carson, good to see you. First of all. Likewise. Hi. Uh, seems that. Uh, the ambiguity of uh, surrounding um, culture, that that same ambiguity uh, or misuse uh, surrounds the word safety. And that safety, from my perspective, is only verifiable in past tense, but not looking forward. There's, there's looking forward, you've got to manage risk and you've got to do a lot of, of things to um, 
create a safety res a safe result. But uh, what are your thoughts on on that same ambiguity around the use of the word safety? Uh, yeah, safety. <clears throat> I, uh, I I have a piece lying around there where I try to discuss what what is safety and. You can approach it by so many different ways, and, and none of these uh, give, give a complete picture. Uh, all only show a, a little part. And I, I would say, uh, uh, yes, uh, safety is uh, is most easily uh, assessed uh, in in the back rear mirror because then you see, uh, oh, there we weren't safe or not safe enough, perhaps. Um, I, that's perhaps why I wrote a Dutch book on, on risk, uh, because the risk is about the future. And, and the, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty about, uh, well, what, what, what's good enough? What, what's safe enough? But I think um, you can um, do something uh, also uh, proactively. You, you can uh, certainly discuss uh, uh, if we approach things this way and then have some sense about uh, the, the risks there are and, and the efforts you make. I, I think you can uh, say, yeah, okay, we consider this safe enough but keep in mind, uh, we, we, we may be off because uh, surprises do happen. The world is uh, complex and then we don't uh, know everything. Well, Carson, uh, I'm dealing with a client right now because this is all great discussion, but when you're in the field, in the moment, it's actually a very emotional issue uh, because when somebody does something wrong, people crave justice, right? Some, there's always people who want to see some kind of punishment. And in fact, this morning I saw a doctor who was being put in handcuffs. And I was so happy to see that because he'd been abusing women for so long, you know, and I thought, oh, good, you know. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, that's not very restorative, is it, Rosa? But anyway, um, I, uh, the, my client wants, they had a big blow up. So now they're under scrutiny and they have to improve their safety culture because that comes from the regulators. You must improve your culture. Uh, so they're looking at just culture and they're looking at um, you, uh, psychological safety, uh, how to uh, get people to feel included and belong. But the very first thing they have to take care of is how, uh, how are we going to discipline people? How are we gonna hold people accountable? So I, I need some help because uh, how can you do restorative justice and, and, um, and get people to feel included and they belong and psychologically safe when the very first question is, uh, was the uh, person on drugs? Uh, was you know, did, was he willingly disregarding the rule? I mean, how, how can you go from that to psychological and maintain psychological safety? Oops, I think Karsten, I blew Karsten out of the water. Oh, there he is. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'm still there. Uh, there. There's something happening on the screen here. Uh, um, Great, great question, uh, uh, Rosa, and, and a very hard one that I don't have an answer to, because uh, you have these different objectives that you uh, need to, uh, to address. You, you need to acknowledge, probably first, because there are different needs that are around, which is one of the underlying uh, issues in, in a restorative justice, uh, that there are needs that, uh, that have to be met. And, and then how do you meet these needs uh, best? Uh, there's probably no, no uh, one solution for all these, uh, these questions, I, I would say. Uh, and, and that isn't the answer that uh, your client will want because uh, probably your client uh, wants a flowchart. Uh, how are we going to deal with these things and how are we going to deal with these things consistently and every time the same because um, 
uh, that's what uh, the world expects from us that we act consistently um, problem is if you act consistently if you follow a flow chart or the algorithm that uh, that starts the question um, then you will do uh, justice in some cases uh, but probably uh, treat some people very unjustly and and that that's a big problem but uh, i i'm uh, i just I, i'm i'm very conflicted here i must say because i i understand the desire organization i work for is also a one that that needs to do stuff very structured and needs to show the world uh, how how we do stuff in in a very transparent ways um and and it's very hard to explain to people that well but this case is something special and, and we need to treat this uh, differently because most people don't look uh, deep most people uh, only look at, at the surface and then uh yeah uh, that, that they will criticize you uh, in, in in the end uh, no matter what you do probably okay. so uh I, I think if, if I had to, if I had to solve the, and, and this is quite mm -hmm. spontaneous now, if I had to solve the problem, I probably would suggest some kind of a procedure, but a flexible procedure that leaves a room for assessment at various points and that, that you, well, get, get away uh, uh, with, with treat, treat, treating people like differently, but are different. Sorry, Rosa. Uh, I just wonder if you designed something like that. That would be really interesting to see because I think we need more diamonds in that matrix. More yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what I meant. Uh, more, more assessing uh, points where you, well, we do this this way or we do this the other way, and yeah, yeah. So just well, we, 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 we can't solve it here now. So. Thank you. I, I may have to call you and, and pay you for an hour of counseling. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so we're in, the, we're in the last 10 minutes and I want to give Carson an opportunity to talk about his part six. So now that we know what not to do, you write about looking forward, taking a, taking a segue from you, Fred, and what we should positively focus on. What do you suggest? What I suggest, um, well, um, let, let's start at the beginning of our conversation. Uh, please do work on culture, but uh, try avoid uh, talking about it. I, I think that's that's very useful uh, to start with and adapt. Uh, your language to the people you are talking to. I, I was at this conference uh, last month uh, where I heard from uh, from a big uh, company uh, how they had uh, adopted uh, um, HOP, human uh, organizational performance in their uh, processes. And, and the one thing that, that really stood out in their presentation was uh, that they said uh, we were very conscious uh, in the language we were going to use towards frontline workers and managers. So they don't mention stuff like culture, uh, psychological safety, resilience, and so on. They translate the concepts uh, to uh, language that people understand. So instead, they speak about... Uh, uh, that it uh, that you have the opportunities to speak up uh, safely without repercussions or whatever, or uh, that they uh, talk about uh, when when it comes to resilience. Uh, how how do we uh, handle uh, uh, unexpected situations and how do we keep up safe production uh, when surprises happen and so on. So that that's one thing. Um, uh, and just continuing on uh, on the language uh, part, um, but by calling things differently, I think you can uh, affect uh, a culture also in in very uh, powerful ways. 
uh, as I said, the culture is about interactions between people by changing the language and how people uh, talk to each other. Uh, I think that's a, that's a very good way forward in, um, in uh, changing things, nudging things or influencing things in, in better ways. For example, uh, instead of, uh, uh, it's, it's very popular at the moment, uh, talking about uh, excellent investigation, talking about learning uh, reviews or whatever, because that, that gives a, a bit of a different focus. When we had this session to prepare um, uh, this, uh, this uh, session here, uh, I told you, Gary, about uh, the, the incident management system. Uh, when we implemented uh, in, in my organization, we, we uh, had to develop a new one, buy a new one, and then configure it for us. And at some point in the process, we decided we are not going uh, going to call it an uh, incident uh, management uh, uh, system. We're calling it an uh, improvement system because we want to have it. Uh, it has to be wider than just uh, investigating it, uh, things going wrong. We also want to use it uh, positively. And of course, uh, the, the issue is not to report incidents. The issue is uh, we want to catch, capture uh, learning opportunities and then learn from them. So we, we call it improvement system. And that's small drops that help to uh, influence uh, how we talk and interact. And I think that that's very useful. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Now, um, are there any questions? Tom, you've got one. Go ahead, Tom. Tom. Just unmuted, sorry. Yeah, I wonder whether it's it's inappropriate to think of something being a bad culture. We do hear a lot of people say that it, it's a bad culture and it needs improving, and whether it's better to think of cultures as being inappropriate or perhaps a mismatch between leadership and technician or the culture of the organisation and the risks that they're managing. You might have a culture that's very good at occupational safety and very bad at major hazards, for example. But do, we do seem to use the this sort of good and bad, which you would never do in a wider context. No one ever would say, you know, French Canadians are bad in their culture, but that's effectively what we do in safety. You know, it would be completely inappropriate. Yeah. I just wonder whether there's a better way of thinking about it. Oh, yeah, you, you are so right. Uh, I, I think we, we should drop the whole uh, normative uh, stuff uh, with when people uh, start talking about me, a uh, good culture or even a, a positive or proactive or whatever, I, I don't think it's, it's useful because you're just sticking a label on it. Uh, and and it's, it's also a, a bit from a downward looking uh, point of, uh, well, we, we are better. And, and that's basically what happened with Chernobyl too, uh, because it was a Western report that was written. And uh, the, the underlying suggestion there is, uh, well, uh, an accident like that can't happen in, in Western Europe or the Western world because it was due to the Soviet safety culture. So uh, go, go figure. But um, uh, the thing about uh, we wouldn't do this to other cultures, we actually did. Where we colonized uh, uh, other uh, uh, <laughs> countries, other areas. Uh, we brought our European uh, cultures and then <laughs> stamped that on uh, on to the the people that are living there, because well they they were just barbarians, or heathens, or well what what you want to call them that they didn't have a good culture. They needed our culture, which we exported, and we're still uh, having the well the the effects of that, good and bad. Any other questions? Vince, you all went? Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, got palm is it through mute? Not working. You're on. There you go. go. Okay. Uh, comment and I have a question. Um, I've experienced a safety culture. Maybe I've been around too long, but when I first started working in the chemical industry, um, and when I was told to go to uh, human resources to acquire hard hat, shoes, gloves, um, whatever, 
because safety was an employee benefit. That was the culture. Safety was an employee benefit. So where we are today is truly a culture. What I've experienced over the years is culture takes time. Uh, at a minimum, up to five years, maybe a little bit longer. Carson, I'd like your comment on the time. Um, I think uh, I still don't have a conclusive answer to that. Okay. <laughs> Let me start by saying that, yes, culture takes time. I, I think uh, influencing culture uh, in ways that you would like it to be, that takes time. Yep. Uh, disrupting an existing culture and, and uh, destroying everything that was before, that probably can be done overnight because that's often just a matter of uh, changing uh, the CEO and then changing uh, the management incentives. And, and there you go. True. Yes. Uh, so so uh, culture change can be uh, very quick, uh, but um, I'm afraid the results will probably not be what you like. But if you want to influence culture in, in ways that are positive, um, I think you lead a lot of patience and, and a lot of uh, well breath uh, to, to keep going and then give another drip and give another drip and start again and, and influence yeah. yet another manager and, and so on. So yes, sure. yes and no. Agreed. Yeah. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, so I'd like to ask my very last question to Carson. What would be your three takeaways you would like to leave with the viewers? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I did one. Don't, don't talk about it, but uh, please keep it in your mind. Uh, use it as a lens rather than a possible tool. Um, and uh, as we said in the beginning, don't cover up uh, uh, actual matters uh, with, the, with the term culture because you will probably only uh, confuse people um, and, and perhaps not address the thing that you really want to do something about, like uh, making uh, uh, better trade-offs between safety and, and uh, production and so on. And um, uh, the, the most powerful way uh, to, to work on culture, if you must, if you want, uh, is probably uh, do something uh, on the interactions, like changing, uh, changing the language or perhaps uh, facilitating uh, communication between people. Safety is all about trade-offs. So I think um, safety culture, if you want to improve it, uh, improve the dialogue that there is between uh, people in an organization. I think that's, uh, that's a very useful thing. And, and you don't need big programs for that. Just do it, uh, well, underneath, slowly creeping, and take your time as if in set. All right, great. Well, we're at the top of our, and I want to respect everybody's time. So tomorrow, back over to you. Thank you, Gary. This is a great conversation. And thank you very much, Carson, for taking the time out of your day to join us. I think we need to continue the conversation. I'd like to get into the difference between culture and group dynamics, because I know that's something that um, is often left off of the table and that can work into to here for another time. But uh, thank you to all our audience for joining us today and uh, making this conversation possible. So on behalf of Safepedia, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat>